Hey everybody, um, just going to give you a little uh, recording for week two. I hope everybody did well for week one. Um, I'm still going through some of y'all's blogs, the first two. Um, I hope to get a good bit of them graded if, you know, by the end of today, if not earlier. Some of y'all probably already received a grade if you uh, go in and check. Um, what we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this week for week two is sort of continue uh, with blogs three and four, I'm going to show you what I want you to do for those. It should be relatively easy, and it really shouldn't take you that long to do. And it's all building toward that essay one, right? You should be starting to think about uh, writing that rough draft or typing that rough draft for essay one. And again, you could start sending me uh, multiple drafts pretty much at any point uh, at this time. So... You want to just uh, keep looking at when SA1 is actually due. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the deadlines for blogs three and four and uh, some of the grammar practice that I have uh, in store for this week. So what I want to do is I'm going to share you the screen for blogs three and four and sort of talk to you about what I want you to do for three and four, the reading that you need to do. Uh, for this week that relates to three and four uh, is going to be beneficial not only for essay one, but as you start thinking about the essays later in September, later in October, November, December, and, and so on. So the reading is going to be beneficial uh, basically for the rest, you know, the remaining of the class as it deals with anything writing, uh, which will be mostly the essays in this course. So let me go ahead and share this screen here. And you should be um, looking at this uh, document. It says blogs three and four on the side here. And basically, the due date is going to be Saturday. I know uh, week one, it was a little bit confusion with the due dates. I'm thinking right now, uh, most due dates for these blog type exercises or these low stake exercises will probably be, you know, every Saturday or so uh, by 11.59. Obviously, you could turn it in a lot earlier than that. You don't have to wait the Saturday before midnight to turn these things in. If you want to go ahead and start blogs three and four after listening to this video then uh, and turn it in within a couple hours after that, you can do so. Um, what I would strongly recommend, though, is that you read pages 9 through 16, 20 through 23, and 24 through 43 in your e-text. Because it's going to make sense of what blogs three and four really needs to look like. Uh, because within those pages, you're really learning about purpose. You're learning about audience. You're learning about tone and content, which are good areas that every piece of writing need to have. You need to have a purpose for it beyond just writing it for, say, a due date or a class or try to get that good grade. Uh, your audience, are you writing for a particular audience? Now, the audience for the most part in this class is probably going to be for me and you could say college level um, people. But you could also think, too, of outside that. Could multiple audiences really pick up your writing and be able to understand it? So that's what you sort of have to think about when you're when you're dealing with audience, not just for essay one, but for all the essays that you're going to be writing in this class. The other thing is the tone. What tone are you taking in this particular essay? Um, is it neutral? Is it uh, is it comical? Is it positive? Is it negative? And again, tone's going to be different as we move on throughout the semester for each one of your essays. And for the most part, everybody's tone for essay one is probably going to be a little bit different too, depending on the actual topic that you choose. Uh, the content basically is it sort of goes back to you need to have audience, you need to have tone, you need to have purpose for the content that makes sense. Uh, the content is sort of, if you look at that picture, um, I think it's on page nine or 10 in your textbook, there's this triangle that has uh, purpose, audience, uh, tone, and then contents in the center. So if you don't really have those three items, your content's not really gonna make sense and vice versa. If you don't have content, 
then really what's the purpose of having a purpose tone or audience at that point? Um, the other pages 20 through 23 deal with your thesis statement. Uh, when you're usually thinking about descriptive writing or sometimes with the narrative writing, which is what essay one is about, they talk about a dominant impression, which in this case is interchange with the word thesis statement. And you've probably learned about the thesis statements in high school, middle school, and maybe sort of the latter end of elementary school. And basically what a thesis statement is, it's usually one sentence in length. It ends with a period. It's the very last sentence of your introduction. And it basically tells the main idea of your entire paper. Uh, it's sort of like the fuel that keeps your paper going. If you, most of us drive or have a truck or some sort of vehicle that we have to put gas in. And if you ever ran out of gas, you realize it's, it, it sort of sucks because you usually run out when you're not so uh, close to a gas station. You have to get that gas can, hopefully if you got one, and you have to sort of walk to the gas station and walk back. Well, the same thing as you need fuel, you need gasoline to keep your vehicle going. Your thesis statement is the fuel of your paper, meaning if you don't have a thesis statement, your paper is going to run out of gas probably by the time you get to page two. And then you're just for the sake of writing, writing something that doesn't have a point. So you're wasting your time writing something that doesn't have a main idea. And then whoever reads, which would probably be me in this case, whoever has to read your paper, is going to realize by the time we get to the middle of page two that you're running out of gas, you don't have a thesis statement, so you're not going to get a good grade because you don't have a main idea, you don't have a main point. So you want to make sure that you have a thesis statement for all the essays that you write, but especially for this one coming up, essay one. Um, and if you look, that's sort of number four, with one of your uh, your blogs three through four that you have to sort of answer. And we're, we're gonna go through some of these questions here momentarily. Um, notice though, there is a difference too when you read pages 20 through 23 uh, between a topic sentence and a thesis statement. The thesis statement's the, the main idea of your entire paper. So whatever you plan on talking about in that narrative or descriptive paper in two to four pages, that's your main idea. Topic sentences go with each one of your individual body paragraphs. The topic sentence is sort of like a mini thesis because it always sort of wraps back around to your main idea, but it's usually the very first sentence of every one of your paragraphs. Each one of your paragraphs is gonna have at least one topic and one topic sentence that sort of fulfills what's gonna be discussed or explained or informed in that particular um, paragraph. If your, sentence, if your paragraphs don't have topic sentences, then again, you're sort of setting yourself up for a bumpy ride because you have nothing to really add to that particular paragraph. Uh, your paragraphs, just like your overall paper, need to make sense. So again, that's why I would keep one idea per paragraph. Don't try to cram two or three ideas because one, you get lost. Two, you may not have a properly styled uh, topic sentence. And two, it just makes your, your paragraphs really long and awkward uh, when you can use paragraph breaks to make the writing flow a little bit smoothly for you and your reader. Uh, the other thing is that we have to start talking about a little bit more is you're going to see this in pages 24 through 43 is the method of organization for your paper. Are you going from, are you doing chronological order, which for most narratives, you have a beginning, middle, and end. That's probably where most of you are going to start. Um, that's probably where I would start if the whole deal of narrative and descriptive writing is something strange to you at this point. You also have the order of importance, right? You go from least to greatest or greatest back to least. Um, so you want to think about that. And that's one of the questions number five here. Uh, that you would want to sort of answer. Um, so if you look really, you need to sort of do those readings to be able to really understand questions one through five as it relates to your blog. So number one is basically, like I said, your purpose for completing essay one is what? So you wanna go beyond the surface. You wanna go beyond that, you know, it's due in a couple of weeks, that it, it's the first assignment for this college course. Uh, I wanna get an A in a course. 
A on the paper. You want to tell me a little bit more than that, right? You have to have a purpose. Is it is it one that you know is strongly is a topic that you strongly care about, or is a challenging topic, right? You want to go beyond just what you know everybody else is basically wanting, and that is they want that A, right? So you want to go beyond that. Number two, your audience for SE1 is who? And in a lot of ways, I sort of answered that already, right? For the most part, your audience is probably going to be multiple audience, right? Um, universal audience. Anybody in the world, if they had a copy of your paper, can they just pick it up and read it? I mean, obviously, you know, if it's a young kid or something like that, may not be able to understand it. But most of us probably from about the time we're 12 or 13 on up, with those topics, unless you chose something different for number three, uh, could probably understand number one and number two uh, relatively easy, right? We've all had various responsibilities going from being elementary school and middle school to high school and now to an adult. So we could probably easily get, um, get a grasp of number two. And most of us have had that ex spouse or that ex uh, girlfriend or boyfriend that we just recently bumped into at Target or Walmart. Um, so we can sort of relate to that one as well. Now, again, the tone of essay one really is going to determine on the tone that you want to provide in your essay. Um, is it neutral? Number two might be more of a neutral tone or it could be more educational or informative, depending, because, again, you're talking about your responsibilities. Um, you're not necessarily being comical there. You're not necessarily being um negative necessarily uh you could be constructive right um with the first topic though dealing with your ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend the tone there could shift right it could be positive in some light it could be negative in others it may not totally be neutral throughout uh especially if the breakup of that relationship happened at a bad time where you didn't really tie in any loose ends and now seeing that person for the first time since then you have those hard feelings come back. So it could be angry. It could be sadness. It could be happy, right? So you're going to go through the gamut of emotions with that first topic. And then again, if you pick your topic for number three, it's probably going to vary depending on what your topic is. And what I would suggest is that if you chose a topic for number three and you haven't really emailed me about that topic, please email me before the end of this week so I know what you're planning on doing. Um, what your direction is, if you're going to have enough to give me two to four pages. Uh, because really, I would say after you finish blogs three and four, you really need to start rough drafting this paper, um, if not sooner, right? Some of you have already started doing the rough drafts before the blogs, and that's fine. You can, you can sort of skip around and do that with this. But definitely by the end of the week, I need to start seeing more drafts. Uh, because if you start looking at your uh, checklist, you know that SA1 final draft, the one I'm really going to be grading, is going to be coming up within another week or so. Number four, what is your thesis statement? Again, that's basically your dominant impression. It's the main idea of your entire two to four page paper. Um, so it needs to be one sentence in length. And it really just needs to uh, have one major idea, right? One major significant big idea that you're going to cover and those 500 to 1,000 words, right? Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Don't try to give me four or five ideas because that's going to make your paper a lot longer than 1,000 words. Just keep it at one and sort of extend on that particular central point. And with the thesis statement, usually you sort of have an idea of the method that you plan on using to organize it your essay. Now, this method is a little different than the pre-writing method, right? The pre-writing method was basically just to get your ideas on paper to help you with the outline. The organization or, or development is how you plan on structuring your, your paragraphs throughout the entire two or four page process. Again, are you starting from a chronological timeline, meaning you're going from point A to point B or first, second, third? Are you doing something more general to specific or specific to narrow. Um, again, if you look at pages 24 through 43, it will give you a, a pretty good idea of some of the other methods that you can organize your essay. I mean, obviously you're gonna give me description and you're gonna give me narrative, um, but you're wanting to move beyond that 
in a way of how you're actually going to style the paper. Uh, if you looked at some of those two sample student essays in the narrative and descriptive section of your e-text, they're about two or three pages in length. They're both A quality papers. You might start to see a little bit about how they set up their method of organizing their essays. So that's something that you can kind of, you know, look at, think about as we go from Monday to the end of the week. Again, this is due on Saturday by 11.59. Of course, you can have it into me a lot sooner. I mean, obviously, if you turn it in sooner, you'll probably get a grade on it sooner. Um, so to deal with blogs one and two, right? Like I said, there's still a few that I have to grade. If you turn everything in, it makes sense, right? I can follow your pre-writing strategy and follow your outline. You did proofread and edit it, that type of stuff. You turn it in before the deadline and chances are you got a hundred on both blogs one and two. So three and four is going to be set up similar. If you answer these five questions and you turn it in before 1159 this Saturday, then you should be on your way to your A. Uh, if you miss blogs one or two, right, you only turn in one and didn't turn in the other. Well, remember last week there was one due on uh, Wednesday or Thursday and there was another one due on Saturday. So pay attention to deadlines. I mean, from here on out, we're going to try to make most things due on Saturday if possible. Again, you don't have to wait the Saturday. You can turn stuff in a lot earlier, especially if you go to other classes or you work, or you got family, you don't want to have the weekend. And I think a lot of uh, students in both of my online classes, I think they waited the Friday or Saturday to actually log in and start looking at stuff. When this week one stuff been up since, you know, the last two weeks. So basically everybody that was enrolled in the class had two weeks to do the, you know, week one stuff. But a lot of folks waited the Friday and Saturday night to try to do it and didn't realize that they already missed the Thursday deadline. So this is one of those classes that you need to log in regularly and you need to keep up weekly uh, because once a weekly folder goes away, basically Saturday, Sunday, the other weekly folder will uh, pop up. And once something disappears, it's gone, right? I can't go back and really open stuff up. So if you don't turn stuff in, just know you're gonna get the forever zero moving forward. Um, if you turn stuff in, that's gonna be better on you grade wise because generally most folks make higher than a zero if they turn something in. All right, so you can email me again if you have any questions about blogs three or four. We are gonna try to move into the grammar section of the course. And again, I'm not gonna lecture so much on the grammar as much as I'm gonna just show you some decent uh, material in our book that will help you. Um, so if you look here, we're looking at page 195. I think this was sort of a continuation from last week. Um, we're dealing with co uh, components of a sentence, right? And a lot of this stuff, again, the grammar is not really new in the course. You've heard a lot about this grammar stuff going back to about second grade. So in a lot of ways, this is just a review. So, but at the same time, you need to have decent grammar, decent spelling, that type of stuff to make your essays um, really get the high marks, right? If you can't spell or you can't use a comma at this point, uh, then we really need to focus on that because otherwise the content um, and the stuff that you're trying to bring into your essay one, essay two, so on and so forth, really isn't going to make sense because you're not projecting your message uh, if you don't have proper grammar and spelling. So think of compound subjects. You've probably heard about that. Usually, um, one thing to keep in mind is that a complete sentence has a subject, a verb, and a complete thought. Now, usually subjects are nouns or pronouns. We know what a noun is, basically a person, place, thing, or idea. Uh, you can have more than one of those, right? In this case, the students and the teacher, teachers are your compound subjects. So just keep that in mind. Prepositional phrases is a group of words that cannot function as a clause because it lacks either a subject, a predicate, or both. So basically, a prepositional phrase would be considered a fragment. So the difference between a complete thought and a fragment is fragment lacks a subject, a verb, or a complete thought. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. Uh, participle phrases, 
they usually deal with the past or present participle of the verb. So think of ing as being your present participle or ed as being your past. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we look at misplaced and dangling modifiers here momentarily. Uh, you do have exercises, and I believe our particular book doesn't necessarily have answers to those exercises. You can practice these if, if you want. If you want to do a few and you know, send me and say, hey, am I doing this okay? Just give me the page number and the number. Um, but for the most part, you're not really required to do every single one of these grammatical exercises because if I try to collect 25 grammatical you know, exercises from every student, nothing to get done. So the exercises with the grammar stuff is really up to you. I would say if you know grammar, is sort of a weak subject in your writing, I would do as much of these grammar exercises and get the feedback it, you know, as you can. Um, otherwise, I would probably look at some of these and say, if this was on a test or a quiz, which one would I have the most problems with? And try to work those out because your grammar quizzes are gonna be somewhat similar to what you see here in exercises. They're not necessarily going to tell you to underline or circle because you might not have that capability on Microsoft Word, but they may ask you to correct a sentence, right? Add a comma here or turn this fragment into a complete thought. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. Like I said, you will have a handout coming up. If it's not already you know, uploaded, it will be uploaded by the end of the week. That is going to be about 30 questions. Uh, you're going to be responsible for the first 15 this week and then 16 through 30 next uh, in a way of practicing for the grammar quiz in a couple weeks. The grammar quiz will cover the grammar that we looked at for this week and next. It will only be 10 questions. That, that way, you know, each correct answer is worth 10 points apiece. So obviously, you know, 10 out of 10 will be 100, 9 out of 10 will be 90, 8 out of 10 will be 80. There's really no partial credit. You either get it right or you get it wrong. Um, so I would definitely look over that particular grammar handout that I want to be um, sharing with y'all here. If it's not already uploaded on Blackboard, you will have it, you know, probably Wednesday or Thursday, if not sooner. Um, again, it's going to be one of those things that you're not really required to turn in. Uh, but if you're worried about how well your grammar is improving or not improving before that first grammar quiz, I would suggest that you let me see. Uh, those answers to the first 15 of those particular uh, sentences or those questions. Uh, sentence pattern, right? There's really five basic sentence patterns in the English language. You have subject verb, which you have here an example. Uh, the hammer fell, right? Hammer is your subject, fell is your verb. Notice too, there is a difference between transitive and intransitive verbs. We'll talk a little bit more about that as it gets closer to um, our conversation with verbs. The other is the subject, linking verb, and noun. So the professor is an economist. So we have professor as your subject. The linking verb in this case is is, and then economist is going to be that noun. Um, subject, linking verb, and adjective. So again, subject is going to be athlete. Your linking verb is is. Your adjective in this case is tall. Now some of this, uh, the direct object and indirect object aspect. If you have taken a foreign language, let's say Spanish or Latin or French in the past, uh, sometimes you might still remember what a direct object and indirect object is. Uh, usually with English, you hear that a few hundred times, probably in an elementary school, and then it's sort of like we think that you know it already, what an indirect and direct object is. And a lot of times you do, you just don't think about it um, in those terms. So if you look at this next pattern, you have subject, verb, direct object. So the picture, of course, would be your subject. Through would be the verb. And then the ball, in this case, is your direct object. Usually the direct object will always come after your indirect object. So if you look at your uh, last pattern here, subject, verb, indirect object, and direct object. So lobbyist would be your subject. Gay would be your verb, your indirect object in this case is the congressman, and then the direct object is money. Um, be glad that we don't have to do diagramming sentences at this level, or the diagrams would be all over the place. 
Compound subjects, joining clauses with coordination. I do give you a handout online that talks a little bit more about coordinating conjunctions. You also probably heard of those as being fanboys. Uh, this chart is a really good chart to see uh, and study. This will probably be a helpful when it comes to the grammar quiz. Because if you notice, usually you'd want to use a comma and one of these fanboys in between two complete independent clauses or two complete sentences. So when you hear the word or read the word independent clause, they mean complete sentence. Uh, if you see the word dependent clause or dependent sentence, they mean fragment. So just keep that in mind. And as you can tell, each one of these fanboys means something. For indicates a reason or a cause and joins two ideas. Nor gives indicates a um, negative, but is usually contrasting or offers an alternative, so indicates a result. So generally you wanna use a comma in one of these fanboys and make sure that com what comes after that fanboy is a complete thought. As you can tell here, I will not be attending the dance, comma four, I have no one to go with. So it gives us sort of a, a reason and a cause. That's why you wouldn't put comma but, right? There's not, the sentence doesn't make a contrast or comma so. Uh, it has to go with comma four in this case. That's the only fanboy that really fits. Same thing here when you're talking about joining two ideas in an addition. We got comma and. Um, posters, you know, announcing the dance are everywhere. Posters announcing the dance are everywhere. And teachers have talked about it in class. So again, it would have to be comma and. It wouldn't be comma four or comma so, right? So as you look through this particular chart, you get sort of the indication, and that's really good. And here again, we have this fanboys. Uh, you've probably seen that maybe in an elementary school at some point. We have conjunctive adverbs, uh, which can also help you, you know, as it relates to uh, fixing a run-on sentence or a few sentence and a comma splice. So if you look, we have this original sentence, Bridget wants to take part in the next Olympics. She trains every day. So we want to combine those uh, particular sentences without necessarily having two sentences separated with a period. And this is how you're going to be able to extend your, your links of your paragraphs and your essays and your sentences throughout the semester. You want to try different sentence patterns. You want to try different sentence styles. Uh, you don't want to use the same simple sentence routine for, you know, from essay one to essay four. You want to do something that's going to improve your writing and make it a little bit more sophisticated overall, not only to you as the writer and, and as a student, but you know, people that read your work wanna see that change, that improvement. So here they're using therefore, but if you notice, anytime you use one of these coordinating or conjunctive adverbs in the middle of your sentence, you always need to have this semicolon at the beginning, and you always need to have this comma at the end. If you have it backwards, right? If you add the comma first and the semicolon, it's wrong. It becomes a comma splice. If you just have the comma here and nothing there, it's wrong. You still have sort of like a comma splice mixed in with a run on. So it has to be punctuated with the semicolon before the word and then the comma after. This is a really good chart. Again, it doesn't um, give you all the uh, conjunctive adverbs that you're going to use or possibly can use. But the good thing about this chart, it gives you the function, right? Also, furthermore, is addition, likewise, comparison, emphasis, indeed. So it sort of gives you the reason where you'd want to use it in the sentence. And it gives you a couple examples with that particular word in the sentence. Again, if you want to uh, see more conjunctive adverbs, I would go to Google and just type in a list of conjunctive adverbs. You're probably going to get two or three hundred. Um, but it's a good list to have print out next to you when you're trying to write that uh, essay one or essay two because you're not using the same words over and over and over again. Will you uh, need to, rem you know, remember everything or be tested on all these? No. Uh, some of them you may never use, but it's always good to have a list because then you can sort of pick and choose the ones you really want to use in your paper to help, you know, get your writing across, get your message across. Complex sentences, <coughs> joining clauses with subordination. Again, sort of like the conjunctive adverb, we have this big box 
you can go to Google and, and, you know, put in the list of this too. It gives you some function. It gives you an example and it gives you a few of the words. Again, you're not going to be, uh, you're probably not going to memorize all of these or need to use all of them throughout the semester. But if you have a problem of using, let's say, after a whole lot of times, or if a bunch of times, you have other options to use now. You can find synonyms for those. Relative pronouns, adjective clauses. Really, when they talk about relative pronouns, and here again, the chart's going to be helpful. Uh, who, whom, which, that, when, where, or whose. So anytime these charts pop up, I would definitely look at those. Uh, if, if nothing else, they will be a good study guide to help you study for the first quiz. And you can relatively, you know, print them off and have sort of a, you know, staple them together and have sort of like a collection of them. Again, if you want to try some of these exercises, you're free to do so. Um, but I think the grammar handout that I'm going to uh, upload, if it's not up, like I said, if it's not up there already, will be helpful because it mimics the quiz that I'm going to give you more so than maybe some of the stuff in the book. Common big errors that you're going to have to avoid in writing uh, papers, fragments, run-ons. Uh, as you can tell here, right, it says the runner is staggering in 100 degree heat. Well, it's a fragment. Why is it a fragment? Well, we do have a subject, right? Uh, the subject in this case is runners. We sort of have a complete thought in the uh, 100 degree heat. A lot of folks say, well, we do have a verb, staggering. Well, staggering really isn't a verb, right? In this case, going back to earlier on, it's part of those uh, present participles. So we need a linking verb. We're staggering. Now it makes it a complete thought. Um, unless you could earn money, for tuition. Well, you could say, well, that we do have sort of a subject here with she and could earn, but it's really not telling us much. So that's why this particular writer puts unless, because again, it's one of those uh, transitional words up front, unless she could earn the money for tuition, comma, and now what comes after that comma is a complete thought. She have to drop out of school. She would have to drop out of school. So that's where you turn this sentence from a fragment to a complete thought is by adding that independent clause at the end. Um, so just keep that in mind. Again, it gives you different examples to sort of follow through. Sometimes you would hear a run on sentence as a few sentence. So don't get those two confused. They're both the same. And basically what a few sentence or run on sentence is, is that a sentence is smashed together. It keeps running on like a train or keeps going on like a train without any punctuation. You usually, the easiest way probably to fix a run on is to put a period after where the first sentence ends and capitalize where the next sentence will begin. So if you look at this particular example, a family of foxes lived under our shed. Young foxes played all over the yard. So if you hear that little pause, it's right here. So we really need to put a period after shed and capitalize the Y and young to make that a complete uh, sentence. You could also do, you know, comma and a fanboy. You can do a semicolon. You can do one of those conjunctive adverbs or transition words. So you really, if you can fix a um, comma splice or a run on, you can do so in a five different ways. And each way is sort of interchangeable, as you can tell about the comma splice. The comma splice is basically this. Uh, some folks uh, link it up with another form of a run on. It's really, it, it's a different type of error because you're using a comma but you're using the comma in between two complete thoughts. So that's why it's a comma splice. So if you have a complete thought here, like you do in sentence one, and a complete thought here in sentence two, you don't need to have just a comma. You can have a comma and a fanboy would fix that. Uh, we looked outside, comma, and the kids were hopping. That would be the best. Otherwise, you would just get rid of the comma, put a period, and capitalize the T, make two sentences. And they sort of tell you here, basically what I said, about how to correct run-ons and comma splices with various punctuation rules. So again, that might be something you might want to look at. This long exercise here. Misplaced and dangling modifiers. Basically it says when a 
participle phrase, prepositional phrase, or other modifying unit is not placed next to the noun it describes, the result error is called a misplaced modifier. So if you look here at some of the incorrect examples, it says, turning on the kitchen light, comma, the woman surprised a thief in her nightgown. Well, again, who, who's really um, in the nightgown at this point? Because is it the thief or is it the woman? Well, you would hope it was the woman and not the thief unless the thief is a woman. Uh, so that's why you have to put the nightgown in her nightgown closest to the person that it really represents. So again, looking at the correct example, turning on the kitchen light, comma, the woman in her nightgown surprised the thief. Now it makes sense. Um, another incorrect misplaced modifier. They bought a kitten for my brother called Shadow. Okay, so is wh whose name is Shadow? Is it your brother or is it the kitten? So again, that's why when you go back and look at the corrected form, they bought a kitten called Shadow for my brother. It makes sense now. The patient was referred to the physician with stomach pains. Okay, again, does the physician have stomach pains or does the patient? Well, and we think logically that it's the patient. That's the whole reason of going to seeing the doctor, right? So we'd have to get the stomach pains to who, you know, move it back to who it belongs to. So the patient with stomach pains was referred to the physician. Now it makes sense. Um, it says here sometimes simple modifiers like only, almost, just, nearly, barely, often get used incorrectly because writers often put them in wrong places. So if you look here, Tyler almost found 50 cents under the sofa cushions. Well, he either did or didn't, right? Uh, repaired or corrected. Tyler found almost 50 cents under the sofa, sofa cushion. So if you look, this um, modifier almost really needs to go after, um, it needs to go after the verb and not before it in this case. Dangling modifier or simply a dangler is a word, phrase, or clause that describes something that has been left out of the sentence. When there is nothing that the word, phrase, or clause can modify, then the modifier is said to be dangling. Um, so if you look here, incorrect, racing in the sports car, comma, the world whizzed by. Well, okay, we don't have a subject in the sentence, really. We don't know who is in the car racing. We definitely know the world can't be sitting behind the driver's seat and racing. So we need to add a pronoun or a noun in this case. So if you look at the correct version, as Jane was riding in the sports car, now we have a person because people usually drive cars. <clears throat> Same thing here. Walking home at night, the trees look like spooky aliens. Well, again, who was doing the walking? The trees, if they're rooted in the ground, definitely don't walk themselves. So we need to have a person as Jonas was walking home at night. There, there's our pronoun, right? Um, you can always flip that sentence around a little bit. As long as we have a subject and a pronoun as, you know, telling who's doing the walking. And if you look, it goes on for a little bit. Uh, painting for three hours at night, the kitchen was finally finished. Well, who did the painting? It wasn't the kitchen. The kitchen can't paint itself and finish itself all at the same time. So Maggie was, in, you know, introduced there. Maggie is the one that was doing the painting. So just keep that in mind. Parallelism basically is similar structure and related words, clauses, and phrases. It creates a sense of rhythm and balance. So each one of your sentence, sentences usually has a sense of rhythm and balance. So if you look at these three examples of faulty parallelism, and let's look at the first one. Kelly had to iron, do the washing, and shop and shopping before her parents arrived. Um, the deal is we have one that's iron, right? We have one that's washing and shopping. So these two have the ing. So we really need to turn iron into ironing. Uh, Kelly had to do the ironing, washing, and shopping before her parents arrived. Now we have like um, structure, right? Words ending in ing. Driving a car requires coordination, patience, and to have a good eyesight. Well, again, right here is the problem, right? Because we have, you know, regular nouns here. Um, coordination, patience, good eyesight. 
Ali prefers jeans to wearing a suit. Ali prefers wearing jeans to wearing a suit. So again, we need something else to sort of uh, complement the balance there. A lot of times you have to use your coordinating conjunctions to sort of uh, create that sense of balance and rhythm in your writing. So again, this is where the fanboys will come back into play uh, using uh, uh, creating parallelism using your coordinating conjunctions. Be careful that when you're using then and as that you're using them correctly. Uh, if you look here, faulty parallelism, swimming in the ocean is more difficult than a pool. Okay, well, it sounds correct, but it's off a little bit because you need to use then or as correctly. Swimming in the ocean is more difficult than swimming in a pool. So we need that balance. And again, if you read some of these paragraphs, it talks a little bit more in detail about that. A brisk walk is as beneficial to your health as going for a run. Again, they give you two different ways to correct it. One is a brisk walk is as beneficial to your health as a run. That works. Going for a brisk walk is also beneficial to your health as going for a run. That also works as well. Uh, keep in mind when you're using correlative conjunctions, you have to have them in pairs. So if you're using either or, they have to come either or, not only, but also neither nor, whether or, rather than, both and. So if you're using these, you need to have one with the other. Um, and generally, it's not the other way around. Like you won't say or either. It usually is either comes first and then your next part of the sentence will have the or in it. So don't uh, sort of swap them around. It won't make much sense. And I think they sort of give you some examples of that. We can neither wait for something to happen. So here again, neither. And then, of course, nor needs to come right here. Can we take? But yes, um, as you can tell here, um, there's different uh, situations going on with this particular um, form. So you just want to make sure that you have the right form uh, when you're creating rhythm and balance, not only in your sentence, but really throughout your, your paragraphs and throughout your essay too. Uh, positives, we're probably going to talk a little bit more about those as we get closer to talking a little bit more about commas. Um, but really a positive is you can put two commas usually around a particular phrase, take it out and it still makes sense. The commas in between the, uh, the stuff really gives your sentence more descriptive detail, that type stuff. So like here it says, positive after noun, Scott, a poorly trained athlete was not expected to win the race. If you took these two commas out in this whole phrase, the sentence will still make sense. It's just, we won't have that extra added detail to it. Same thing here, a poorly trained athlete, comma, Scott was not. So again, if you took this out, the sentence still wouldn't make sense, but the positive just gives you more added uh, descriptive. So think about essay one, because it is narrative and description. You might want to add some of these positives in there to uh, help you out. Um, we will probably talk about verbs a little bit more next week. So that's sort of where we're going to stop here uh, with grammar. Again, uh, keep an eye on that um, particular handout. I think I did already upload it, but if not, I double check and get it uploaded before Wednesday. Um, Wednesday, we're going to do another live session uh, through Teams, and I'm going to send out some invites between now and then. And most of the students that did show up, and I appreciate that y'all did show up, those that did last Wednesday, agreed to sort of have you know, a three to four o'clock teams meeting uh, every Wednesday. So we're going to try that three to four. Again, it's not mandatory that you show up because I'm going to record it if there's a lot of people there. And basically, I'm going to upload the video to uh, Blackboard so you can watch it between Wednesday and Saturday. Uh, so again, these videos are only going to be up for a short amount of time because they take up a lot of room on Blackboard. So like this video would probably be up until Wednesday and then I'm gonna take it down to upload the new video from Wednesday to about Saturday. Again, if you have any other questions, uh, you have any other concerns, you can always call or email me. 
I would definitely start drafting SA1 if you haven't and start sending me and Smart Thinking multiple drafts uh, throughout the week. Otherwise, you have a good week, and I will see everybody or talk to everybody, I hope, on Wednesday.